Hello, and welcome to Eddie Hurst podcast version of The War of the Worlds. Here we are in another uh, in-between chapter episode. Thank you so much for joining me. Absolute pleasure. And, of course, happy 2023, uh, if you're listening then. Uh, if you're listening in the future, happy 2023. I mean, that's the advantage of recording this in the past for future people, is that you've still been through that time, I think. Uh, unless this is re- unless you're listening really, really far in the future, in which case, are uh, you sure about this? Uh, <laughs> but uh, thank you anyway. Uh, thanks uh, for listening. Uh, for those of you who are the first time listener uh, to, to the podcast, I'm Eddie Hurst. I'm a, a, a musical comedian based in Manchester, and I, I have been, uh, for the past uh, two, three, three years now, I have been reading The War of the Worlds chapter by chapter, taking it apart, doing deep dives of extra information, making some daft songs inspired by uh, things I read in it and, 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 and adding thoughts, and also having fantastic uh, personal comedy friends as guests and, and some really incredible experts in the field who've been kind enough to give their time and sit down and talk through some of the meatier academic aspects of the book. This is one such of those episodes. So, as with previous times, someone has been kind enough to sit down and talk with me, and as I sit down to then edit the episode, I wanted to put uh, excerpts of this into chapter 8 that was previously, because of course, this is going to be all about germs. What are they up to, eh? Where are they? I can't see them. You can't see them, but they're here. That's, it's it's going to get more more in depth than that, I promise. But my guest in this episode is a historian of medicine at the University of Copenhagen, and also the writer of the book Imperial Bodies in London, Empire, Mobility, and the Making of British Medicine, um, which, which is which is a great book. I'd recommend you read it. It recently won the Whitfield Book Prize. Uh, that that was it won that last year, which is a really prestigious prize in academic writing. So uh, congratulations, Christian. I like to think that the, the courage she got from this interview really sold that. But that would be lying that would be a lie so anyway she sat down uh, and we chatted uh, in depth about germs and germ theory in victorian times and this was recorded when we were we were still in sort of lockdown measures so uh, it's quite quite a, quite an interesting contrast to see uh, the way that we're talking about the world in the interview compared to now uh, of course that is deliberate i deliberately waited until january because of course it's a reflective time of, of you know it's a new year isn't it so we like to look back that's 100 percent the reason uh, and it's definitely nothing nothing else so I hope you find it as interesting as I did to sit down and chat with her. Um, some things before we dive into that. Please do like, subscribe, rate the podcast, tell people on social media if you've been enjoying it. We've got the last two chapters of the book coming up and I'm really excited to share them with you. And also, hey, if you've enjoyed all of the show so far, come see me live! What? What? Yeah, that's right. War of the Worlds is, is live now. It's alive. It, it, it's being performed on a national tour. I'm taking my show, the live companion to this, which is Eddie Hurst's comedy version of Jeff Wayne's musical version of H.G. Wells' literary version, by Orson Welles' radio version, and Steven Spielberg's film version of The War of the Worlds across the country. Uh, we're going to be in Halifax, Wigan, the Lowry in, in Salford. We're going to be at Leicester Comedy Festival, at the Tom Thumb Theatre in Margate, at Arts Depot in London. Put a little link uh, to them in the in the, in the the episode notes so you can have a look and also please do check out Kristen's book uh, and you can see her online she's on she's on Twitter at Kristen underscore hussy uh, I'll put that link below and also a link to her book so um, thanks very much I'll speak to you at the end uh, let's dive into it what a time for science it's it's a top science time it's a top medicine time it's it's a pretty good time to be a historian of of medicine because yeah i don't think we've ever been uh as topical as we oh, are yeah, now yeah, yeah 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 if there's ever been a time for germs it's been uh they're at the, <laughs> they've been at the center stage I'm, like i i wanted to have you on to talk about uh germs because at the point in the book um yeah i think this is probably i'm sure that there are other other examples in literature but I think this is the yeah. first time that germs really have a good go of it yeah they're the, I mean they're like the protagonists the germs that yeah. is yeah unusual that the they're the equivalent of Gandalf at Helm's Day yeah coming yeah. down that hill <laughs> that's, that's him with a little imagine yeah. like I'm sure somebody could do a meme of like the COVID coming down on yeah. Gandalf's head or something like that they probably have yeah sure we're oh. only a Google away <laughs> <laughs> As a historian, it's strange because people are talking about pandemic and talking about germs and like, oh, never, never in the world has anyone ever experienced what we're going through now. And it's like, 
no, like, <laughs> that's not true. <laughs> I mean, uh, ignoring the fact that like we we did already have a great sort of 20th century pandemic, which was the HIV ongoing HIV oh, AIDS yeah, yeah, yeah. epidemic. Um, you know, the 19th century is referred to as the epidemic century. You know, it was it was wow. barely a year would go by that there wasn't some kind of horrible pandemic disease if it was wow. plague or if it's cholera or like super fun yellow fever people were never not sick if you were yeah, living yeah, through yeah. the 1800s so it's sort of no surprise that it's also the time um where science is the most interested in what causes disease and if we could figure out what is making us sick then maybe we could do something about yeah, it sure how long have we had germs i mean like i know we've had uh, them forever uh uh, how long have we thought about a concept yeah, like yeah, yeah. germs? Yeah, That's thank a, you for turning that into a yeah. good question. <laughs> <laughs> the weird thing is, is that we've thought about germs, by which I mean the idea that there are kind of living microorganisms, how, however you want to give, however you want to call that, um, in the environment that somehow infects and cause disease. It's a very old idea. Um, mm. Way back in the 11th century, there was a, an Arab physician named Ibn Sina who had uh, a sort of sketch idea of germ theory. Um, and there are different people over the centuries who've proposed the idea that there are small living things that cause illness mm. in humans, but they've almost always been like laughed out right, of things right, right. <laughs> <laughs> because it was so far away from the kind of prevailing opinion about how disease is caused. So, cause there've been many different theories of disease before we arrive at the germ theory of disease, sure. uh, which is really a, a mid 19th century invention. So germ, germ theory would have been kind of established at this point then? Yeah, I would say it's, it's very well established by the 1890s. I mean, undoubtedly there are still physicians and scientists and quite prominent people, even by around 1900, who are not a hundred percent convinced by things, but it's really it's it's going that way. But by but by the year nineteen hundred, they now have loads of vaccines, so they're able to, you know, sample a, a bacteria from a living organism and then grow it in the lab and then show that it can die. And you know, they're doing a lot of evidence based science by this by this time period. But the idea of germs causing disease was it, it was massively contentious. It, but I'm sure that the opinion has changed a lot from yeah, when yeah. he was a kid, the kinds of things that his parents are thinking to where things stand as he's writing the book. I mean, he's a very okay. unhealthy man. Okay. <laughs> he's a wildly unwell man. Uh, it's it's, it's like someone who's, who's interested in disease, like at a personal level. Yeah, he's invested. <laughs> he needs to yeah. know his enemy. But maybe if he writes nicely about them in his book, they'll be kind to him. He's dreaming a dream of, you know, the, the defeat of illness, I think. Germ theory, I guess, what was what was it before then? It was a very old one, and you could argue that it goes, this, with the kind of core concept of it goes all the way back to like the Greeks, the ancient Greeks, right. um, had the idea that disease was caused by this interplay between the body and the environment, uh, and the traditional idea within Western medicine, and actually indeed in, in many other cultures, uh, was this idea of the humors. Have you heard of this? The four yeah, humors of the body. Yeah, I'm big on the um, humors. Yeah, yeah, and that if if one that every person had their own kind of unique balance of humors, so you could be a choleric person, you know, someone who has more you know bile in them or a sanguine person. So you were different kinds of people, and then depending on what you ate, you know, or how you slept, or if there's a wind blowing outside, or if you get really cold, all of the imbalance of these things is what causes diseases. And in right. order to bring them back in balance, you can then you can do things like you know bleeding. The idea right, was right. if you had too much blood, right? It made you fiery, because I think color is blood. So if you have too much blood, that would balance things out or you would yeah. take, you would purge yourself with enemas. So it was almost like a very kind of manual in out kind of body environment framework. Um, but then by the time the like, we're getting to the 19th century and it's the year 1800, it's it's kind of the same idea at its core, but it's been a bit like jazzed up. It's been like a bit made a bit snazzier by okay. some newer scientific discoveries. Um, and now people talk about miasmas as right. the cause of, of disease. And so for the for at least the first half of the 19th century, if not for most, like if you asked people on the street what it is that makes you sick, they would say it's it's miasma. And the miasma is sort of like a cloud of poison 
that like okay. floats around. And if you happen to encounter it, then it's going to get in you and make you sick. Um, and what it is that's producing these miasmas is like standing water or mud or like garbage. There, there was a sense like if you could smell it, you know, right. and, it, and it smelled bad, yeah. then that is what illness is, um, which is why, you know, the great stink of London um, was such a big problem because it wasn't just that it was it was stinky. It was that it meant that everyone was inhaling the seeds of disease. So a lot of 19th century sanitary movements of like tearing down houses and embanking the Thames and introducing sewers and all really, really good things come from this miasmatic perspective right, of right. disease that we need to keep air flowing, you know, very Florence Nightingale, open the windows, bright light and sunshine. And this is how we're going to disperse miasma and fight off disease. So this is what most people are are right, thinking right. about illness before germ theory starts to take over in the second half of the 19th century. Amazing. It's, it's, it's amazing, isn't it? Like, I don't know. So, it, so, yeah. Just like, how that feels like a very, I don't, I don't know what the word, it feels like quite a straightforward thought process. Yeah. You know, you can see how somebody would like, somebody without the research and without like the equipment and the ability would be like, well, something's got me. It stinks here. That's yeah. probably something, I mean, yeah. They're, they're not, and in many ways, right? Like they're not wrong. You know, yeah. if you have a if you have a cesspool at the back of your house that's not being <laughs> cleaned and there's like festering, you know, waste, like yeah, that's gonna that's how you get dysentery. That's gonna make <laughs> um, it's so it's more like the 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 mechanism is not quite right, but there's an intuition there okay. um, that that totally makes sense, um, and it is also one that it has this authority, you know, Galen and Hippocrates think this, but it's also, I mean, governments like having this idea because disease is always political and it always arises in kind of a broader cultural context. Because if you, if you think that disease is caused by germs, if you think that people can pass disease to each other, as we are currently experiencing, it implies um, a specific you know, thing that the government's going to do, whereas if it's uh, what they call the anti-contagionist position, that it's to do with keeping clean, mm. you know, having good sewers and stuff, then you wouldn't quarantine a ship in the port, you know, you wouldn't lock people in their houses. So they're very different kinds of interrelationships between people and their government and people and each other. And I've never even thought of it with that angle, but that's, yeah, you, yeah, that's fascinating. People, so when people start talking about germs and stuff, right, like Louis Pasteur, the French yeah. chemist, comes up and starts really bringing contemporary germ theories as we know it now, people were like, that doesn't make sense. Yeah. That doesn't make any, you know, it doesn't make any sense. And from that perspective, it, it doesn't make sense. Like if, if disease is caused, like when I say cholera, right, Jon Snow, famous English surgeon, uh, says cholera is caused by something in the water, um, little bacteria living in the water. People are like, well, how does that work? Like, why wouldn't it just get diluted in the water? So much of it is unknown. And that's the thing about microbes and germs that make them fascinating and scary. And I guess really suitable for Wells' story. We come to this passage that we're describing now and he just like finds the Martians dead. He doesn't even explain like what, like, did they get sick from the germs? What kind of symptoms did they have? Were they like yeah, yeah. vomiting or is it a disease? And he's like, no, they're just dead. That's just what it was. What was the opinion of germs? That Cause obviously they cause disease. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is it all about germs being, and I guess even the phrase now we think of germs and we think of germs, that's bad. Yeah, yeah. Um, people at the end of the 19th century, I'm sure as well as was writing this, have an enormous anxiety about germs and about bacteria. I, mean, I think for the most part when people in this period say germs, they mean bacteria. Right. It's okay. a bit confusing. Um because there's a lot of different categories of microorganisms, or sometimes I think he even says microbes in the book. Yeah. Um, you know, is that a, like a fungus? Is it like a parasite? It seems to kind of cover any microscopic living thing. Uh, but for the most part, the science that's happening at the time is interested in diseases that are caused by bacteria. So like tuberculosis is a bacterial disease or, um, you know, yeah, anthrax. And so people are interested in, in bacteria and they're interested in bacteria as causes of disease. And it, you know, now that people know about it, I think they became incredibly anxious about the ways that they encounter bacteria in their 
environment um, yeah. in, in one way, but then also quite optimistic in another sense, because this is the great age of, of vaccines of between 1880 and 1900. Some of the major you know, diseases of, of this period are now, they're saying they're going to be able to tackle them via right. yeah, vaccines. Yeah. But it does create an anxiety about how people interact with, with each other, about, you know, even about the food they eat. There was this this is a little bit after Wells, but in the year like 1903, 1904, there was this film series that got produced um, where they were filming down a microscope and they would film everyday things like a piece of cheese or like a sandwich. Wow. And they would zoom in and in and in until you could see all of the like microbial life. And then that was like, you would go and you'd see that in the cinema. And people were like, oh my God, I'll never, <laughs> I'll never eat again. The good thing is discovering all the causes of the diseases. But sort of the bad thing is, is that there wasn't an immediate like therapeutic effect, right? We don't get antibiotics right, right, right. until, you know, like the Second World War. So people knew that these things were around them, that they were bad. Um, but what exactly they should do about it is more contentious. Um, okay. So and sometimes you even get really like super bad suggestions. And a really I think a really terrifying and also gross example of this is um there was a cholera outbreak in Naples, in Italy. Right. Uh, and it was around the time that cholera had been isolated as a, as a bacteria. So they found out that what was causing this illness were, were these bacteria that live in the guts. Uh, and so one physician had a really bright idea, which is that they would try and attack um, the bacteria at the source, and they were going to make acid enemas. Um, to shoot up the bomb of people who are already <laughs> suffering from cholera. <laughs> this did not work. Um, yeah. It made things much worse. Um, but this, yeah, so you can know the things are there, um, but what exactly you're going to do about it is a bit like, all right, all right then. But then we, of course, also have Lister, right? The great surgeon Joseph Lister who comes up with of making sure that like your skin and, and wounds were clean and then you wouldn't get it. So that is that is a good outcome. Of the two, I would rather have that than the yes. acid enema. I think. Yes. Uh, I don't know. Maybe I've, I know I've, I've had I've had clean wounds. I've never had an acid enema. So, so you know, don't, don't knock it till you try it. I <laughs> Whether it's a medical thing would be really interesting. Like good mm -hmm. stock. Is it a population mm -hmm. having good stock being hardy? Was that part of medicine, or is that just kind of like a like a casual thing people have in medicine? Um, in medical practice, uh, and in the way that people perceived others, um, which is something that I know you've talked to Sabhadra about um, in that really great episode. Uh, and I write a little bit in my book as well, um, that there were ideas that different people had different kinds of susceptibility to disease, that they um, suffered from different kinds of illnesses, uh, and also that they were weak or they were strong. Um, and a lot of this at the time is also racialized. Right. Uh, but in a really, in that classic way that anything to do with imperialism, uh, the more that you look at it, the more it seems to like break down in front of you. So this idea that, you know, white people come from cold places. And so therefore they're like stronger martial races um, right, right. and that people you know brown and black people who come from hot climates are more susceptible to disease and they're sort of you know uh, effeminate or weak and therefore deserve to be ruled these like classic colonial yeah, stereotypes yeah, yeah, yeah. in in fact though when european people go and live in hot places uh, in tropical climates they immediately fall ill and i think what you see in those contexts is is the coexistence of these ideas about disease being caused by germs by discrete disease entities and these old ideas about the environment in a kind of vague general way is causing uh illness and that you can be suited to that environment or you could be not suited one thing that keeps happening in the book is that he's comparing um the relationship that the humans have to the martians with mm -hmm. the relationship that animals have to people so there's a bit mm -hmm. where he compares how rabbits are looked after by humans as to how he thinks the martians are gonna be so i guess it's like is he casting i guess the question is that like now when i think about sort of germs and bacteria and the effect of colonialism you sort of think of like in in north america when it you know so much of the population was wiped out from smallpox mm. and diseases that were brought over by 
explorers was that were they worried about that then yes although it, what they were worried about in the late 19th century is the opposite of this they were, right, were right, right. worried about people coming from india from the sort of british empire and bringing back diseases with them and importing right, right. things like yellow fever importing malaria that was a really big uh, concern people had because uh, there was still this question around okay if we know what's causing the disease which they only discovered in the very late 19th century what causes yeah. malaria um but why you know if it occurs in in india why doesn't it occur in in the uk um uh, and they eventually sort of settled it's because the the vectors of the disease need certain kinds of conditions to right, exist. Right. But if it was malaria it used to be endemic in the United Kingdom, uh, in Kent, there was like a, a whole area of Kent that was known what? to be malaria. Yeah, the Kentish marshes is where you would catch <laughs> malaria. Um, no but then actually in at the end of the First World War, uh, many people, soldiers who've been serving in sort of in Egypt, Palestine, and Macedonia, came back to London and were infected with malaria um so much so that in certain instances there were cases of people who'd never been abroad started getting sick right. from so you know there's always this threat that the diseases the sort of diseased uh, bodies of the empire are going to come back uh, right, and right. get in the mix uh, in the united kingdom uh, although of course as we face climate change now diseases we used to think would only stay put in certain tropical zones and now become <laughs> a problem for for everyone <laughs> yeah sure and that'll be when when they're actually solved unfortunately and then suddenly Probably. we'll have a yeah a, a malaria vaccine although they are working on that now so that's very good and really interesting and also really interesting to see how that's one of the things that's kind of blown my mind about this is the idea that yeah we think of like covid um as being like oh my god this is the first time i've ever experienced anything like this um, and it's like just now nah, it was regular day to day or more or less year to year. It was. But but what he has that's so different, right, is that, is that truly this discovery that germs cause disease. I mean, it's it's one of the greatest, most influential scientific discoveries ever. Absolutely. And it's fascinating as well that it's like, whereas other other sci fi or re- what is it scientific romantic science or scientific romance as it's called has like the idea or the discovery front and center so mm-hmm. like you know jules verne journey to the center of the earth it's like what's the book about they're going to the center of the earth whereas the big mm-hmm. ideas within war of the worlds like yeah. such a big idea to have as the twist of your story it's not mm-hmm. even like not even in the title oh i mean the war of the worlds oh uh, world? yes no you know what the microbial world yeah <laughs> the other world is like what a final act reveal like oh no it's the invisible world we have to deal with now there are sort of academics who are interested in, interested in his attitude towards microbes as positive um yeah. because that's also very unusual at the time right, right. It, there's a lot more actually of this kind of battle war narrative between us and the microbes and for him he's on the microbes are on this on the human's side yeah sure, uh, sure. in a sense uh, and now there's a lot of research around right like probiotics and kind of cultivating our microbes and having good microbes and yeah. bad microbes and I, I don't really think it's fair to say that he's actively anticipating that kind of move because that would be very yeah I just don't think anyone sure. was really thinking things like that right as he was writing but it's not too long afterwards um that that some scientists start suggesting that if we can find yeah the good microbes and and can bring them within us and they can stave off infection on our on our behalf so it's a very it's a very prescient idea yeah absolutely and i think it speaks a lot to his optimism as a writer that Mm -hmm. he's he's, science is often a solution or knowledge of science and discoveries within science are as much a solution to a problem as they are the cause of it So I wanted to play, this is a little bit of a game, I guess. So I thought I'd, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd just throw, some, throw some, uh, I, some of the famous other literature from, okay. from around this time and see how much it's actually based in the science of the time or whether it's just like, you've definitely Great. read an article in the Times and that's, okay. you've run with it. Uh, the first one I've got is, um, it's sticking with Wells, is um, the island of Dr. Moreau. You go to, he goes to, the main character goes to an island and there's Dr. Moreau of the island's fame where he's making human-animal hybrids 
But I think it probably said, I mean, like maybe it's reflecting on debates around uh, animals and science because that was contentious at the time. There were lots of sure. people who didn't want experiments being done on these on these animals. Um, but it's it's probably more uh, a reflection of anxieties around um, sort of humans devol like devolving into animals because I think yeah, that there sure. were discussions around yeah the, the fact that like the human race was somehow degrading over time which you know that's sort of very the temp very time machine right idea right, right. so perhaps yeah, it's, sure. a, it's a, a mix of things like that but uh, the early history of blood transfusion is a terrifying stories of trying to put like hum direct human to human blood transfusion but also putting yeah. like you know goat blood in people Whoa. And people blooded people blooded goats. <laughs> what? What? Um, what? Why were we obsessed doesn't work. with doing stuff with goats in medicine? What was what was it with the goat? I do not know. There's a, a whole interesting kind of history about like what kinds of animals are suitable for doing science with. Uh, like I always think it's crazy. You know, William Harvey, the guy who discovered like that the heart pumps blood around our body. He was working right. mainly with like fish, but that's wow. because he could just he could just go down the market and buy fish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I think a lot of times it's more um, yeah, opportunistic than, pla than okay. planned. I, the next one, uh, we're going to the OG Frankenstein okay. um, and like using electricity to bring, to reanimate. Yeah. I mean, now this is really legit. This is legit really? science. Yeah. I mean, I would say like H.G. Wells, Mary Shelley is sort of up on yeah. uh what's going on in the day and is being directly inspired by like widely reported uh, experiments that are going on uh, by people like Galvani who are investigating electricity as the potential kind of spark of life. Right, right, uh, and right. that's that's a big qu you know question. If this is a bit earlier period. You know, what is it that makes something alive? What is it that makes something dead? Uh, is this is sort of a great question. And there's a, a series of scientific, like very rigorous scientific experiments yeah. that are done to show that somehow the application of this new force, uh, electricity, uh, seems to, you know, be compatible with the human body. You know, and to an extent that is true our bodies do run on electricity that's how our nerves yeah. talk to each other you know um right, right. so yeah uh, there's a lot of i can if that's 100 i mean obviously it's taking the observation that you can sure. use electricity to sort of move uh muscles and kind of temporarily reinvent body and taking that to the next degree but yeah that's fair that's well grounded in good, scientific good, inquiry good for mary tick <laughs> what <Yeah. laughs> poetry by Approved. night science in the day <laughs> Um, Robert Louis Stevenson, uh, with his uh, book uh, Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde. I don't know. I always thought of, I always think about that book more in terms of of kind of mental health and kind of anxieties yeah, yeah, yeah. around the mind and the body, and uh, you know the idea that you could have different kinds of you know personalities or minds with, within you. What is the human mind, sure. and what is the border between sanity and, and insanity? Which was such an enormous question uh, in, in the nineteenth century. But kind yeah. of physical, physically altering substances. I don't. I don't know about. I don't yeah. know about that one. I'm not sure. But I guess in terms of then, like the mental health of it, because obviously, mm -hmm. I mean, mental health treatment then was ropey <laughs> at best. Uh, I mean, it's it was just that it was mostly not like non-existent in the right for the right. most part. People would if if someone was perceived as being mentally ill and the line around what mental illness was yeah, was sure. very vague. I mean, for the most part, people would be cared for in asylums, which day to day was like, you know, needle knitting uh, right, and right you know, making sure the, the therapeutic idea was that you were well rested and well fed and kept occupied with useful occupations. And over time, you would recover yourself. Mm -hmm. If you were, if you were in a nice asylum, of course, there were other sure. ones, yeah, yeah. particularly earlier in the century that where you'd be like, you know, yeah, chained up and things. Uh, but you don't really start to get super strong kind of psychoactives or, you know, electroshock therapy. It's a bit late. It's a bit later. Right, 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 right. In the nineteenth century. And last one, and this is uh, this is a, a good few decades after after the sort of time that we're looking mm. at. But um, Aldous Huxley in nineteen thirty two, um, son no grandson of Thomas Huxley uh, in Brave New World wrote about Sommer, which I I guess like obviously when you get to sort of sixties seventies and and nowadays antidepressants and the idea of 
um soma being a, a drug that is meant to give you pleasant hallucinations to mm. take to mm. make you feel happy mm. um but in the 30s and i guess before then like was there was there anything on on drugs being used to alter mental states uh yes um I mean, there were a lot of drugs that were being used that were known for being addicting uh, right. because of how they made you feel. Um, so obviously a big scare around opium and sure, the use yeah. of things like laudanum uh, in medicine. And then they isolate morphine uh, right. from that. Um, so the end of the 19th century, as much as they're sort of creating vaccines, they're also creating new therapeutic drugs. Uh, right, and in the right. realm of kind of painkillers especially um things to help you sleep things to make you calm the kind sedatives uh which would have had the side effect of giving you know euphoric feelings there's an enormous anxiety around right, right. addiction uh to those sort of those kinds of happy feelings and on, on the one hand you don't have a lot of effective like antibiotic treatment so you sort of have no choice but to give people really strong painkillers but it's very widely appreciated that that's not that has very negative effects so how do you cope with addiction in society uh, and it's it's a period where drugs the taking of drugs even the smoking of like weed for example which there are people are familiar with from other countries become very you know shamed and and right, isolated right. and we get this idea that drugs are for medicine only and that only okay. physicians can prescribe them because they're dangerous to you if you don't right, do that right. so there's kind of a great from, from a time in you know 1850 where you could pop down the grocers and buy yourself a bottle of opium if your mama asked for it <laughs> to the early part of the 19th century where when that book was being written where things were getting more and more and more regulated yeah um, sure. that's a that's a big change in in medicine so that that totally makes sense as a as yeah. a framework i had the thought of just like you would sort of get your own medical treatment or ask someone to make it you as we as you get later into the 20th century it's like it comes in a little pack and only a trained person can put it in that pack for you and everything. Uh, yeah. Although, you know, saying that there's still, you know, medications and drugs that, that we would today consider to be controlled substances right. uh, that continue yeah. to be sold, okay. you know, sort of o over the counter in the middle of the 20th century. So it's, it's a slow, it's a slow okay. process. Um, but yeah, they do start restricting things like cocaine and, yeah. and morphine and opium and things. Um, yes. <laughs> Amazing. Oh, thank thank you. I feel like I feel like I'm I'm prepped to uh to if I go in a time machine to yeah. tell what sci-fi writers at that time are full of shit. I feel like someone who works in the medical humanities with more with science fiction is gonna listen to this and be like, ah, oh, she's got it totally <laughs> wrong. How could well, you no, say that? No. Dr. Moreau is is a classic masterpiece of, <laughs> of you know uh, experimental surgery, and I'd be like, oh no. Well, I did I guess I think this probably I from from what I've I've not read too much on it because quite frankly one novel by H.G. Wells is probably enough for me to yeah. spend so much of my life on um but uh it's I think a lot of it is that sort of vivisections being used as entertainment and yeah. definitely with Wells he's all about going like you guys as humans think you're so smart and so great but imagine if we were no better than animals and it's That's... it's quite it's quite woke actually around yeah, this time yeah. Um, there's sort of a, a coming together of causes, you know, people who are anti-vivisection, pro-women, uh, mm. and often uh, vegetarianism, um, right, yeah, yeah. All, all sort of, uh, you tend to be one of these people. And interestingly, if you're one of these folks, you're also probably anti-vaccine uh, oh, wow. and, and suspicious of germ theory. Uh, so there's like, yeah, there's, a, there's kind wow. of like cliques in victorian society of these these causes what's the story what's the um what's the story there what's the yeah but it's this um this idea around um like individual freedoms you know right so right. so people who are on the left people who are more you know liberal at the time hmm. um you know we talk about women's rights you know yeah. workers rights animal rights um and there was a feeling that the uh, mandatory vaccination laws uh, that they were aimed mainly at the poor uh, and that's okay. true um and that that it was discriminatory towards the working classes the government would force them to undergo a medical procedure against their will right. so it's it's seen as being in the you know i think that yeah. the the anti-vaccine debate has, has always been about mm. the relationship between the individual and the state uh, and what what does this what role does the state play in your life and what do you owe 
other people. And it's to be it's a classic debate that we've never really got to the to the bottom yeah, of sure. individual rights or the idea of public health is predicated on the fact that you take action in your life for the for the benefit of others. And that implies, yeah, a certain kind of political positioning, I think. Yeah, it's fascinating. Well, thank you so much. Thanks so much for coming on, Kristen. It's been been amazing, really interesting. And thank you for, for having so much patience with my <laughs> nonsense questions. Um, uh, could you tell us, like, um, I, I, so I watched the live stream that you and Sabadra did, um, and it was, it was amazing, really interesting, and I can't wait to read the book. Um, would you be able to tell us a little bit about it for, for listeners? Yeah, thanks. Um, so Imperial Bodies in London is a book that gets into some of these questions about the relationship between Britain and its empire in the realms of science and medicine in the late 19th century century. Uh, And it argues that rather than thinking about uh, Western medicine, British medicine being exported to the colonies, I wanted to think about how the imperial context influenced the development of medicine in Britain. How people, European people, colonized peoples from India were so mobile and circulating between the British Empire and London. And in so doing, they brought with them different forms of knowledge, different kinds of questions, and also different diseases that forced, quote unquote, British medicine to be inherently global or imperial in the late 19th century. So it's a book that tries to demonstrate that Britain and its empire were always connected and that you cannot talk about British medicine without considering its its empire and those ideas around the environment, these ideas yeah. about race and how that impacts illness. So very much some of the of the themes you talk about here. Really on interesting. <laughs> and yeah, I think one of the things that hopefully we grapple with as a as a group more, that idea of like there were good things that came out of this, but they came out of it for bad reasons and bad contexts mostly mostly bad (laughs) (laughs) there you go a cheeky little dunk on the british empire before we finish the interview thank you so much for listening everybody and thanks again to Kristen. thank you for coming on the show and and telling us all about germ theory in victorian times a really fascinating topic Uh, it's really interesting to see how uh, new technology and discoveries affect society maybe it impacted old hg when he wrote the book it definitely absolutely did so, like I said before, you can follow Kristen on Twitter at Kristen Hussey, um, or you can see her website, kristenhussey.co.uk, and her book. If you'd like to read uh, more about the context around this, yeah, you wanna you wanna have some cheeky citation for when you when you obviously, as a similarly to me, cool dude brackets trademark, uh, have an argument about Victorian germ theory of all your friends, as is so often to happen. You can grab yourself a copy of Imperial Bodies in London: Empire, Mobility, and the Making of British Medicine. So you can truly reach the top of the germ expert scale. Which I I assume exists. Please do like, subscribe to the podcast. We're going to have the next two final chapters coming out very soon. And also we've got a whole book before this. So if you haven't listened before, what are you waiting for? Start at the beginning. You missed all of all, all of the novel. Please do check out the live shows that are coming up. I'm really excited to bring them. And also, I have a brand new show, a work in progress, which is all about uh, Lancashire witchcraft. Ooh. Will it feature as much deep dive and obsessive exploration as this? Absolutely. Will it have aliens in? N- no, no, not not at time of writing. But I'm not against it. So uh, you know, there's a bit of a bit, a bit, a bit, a bit of a ooh, bit of mystery for you to enjoy there. Uh, that will be taking place. The first version of it at the Leicester Comedy Festival in a very work in progress part on the 18th of February, which is the same day that I'll be doing War of the Worlds at Leicester Comedy Festival. So you see that half five at Peter's Pizzeria, and then run like I will be to the LCB Depot to do Eddie Hurst's comedy version of Jeff Wayne's musical version of H.G. Wells' literary version via Orson Welles' radio version and Steven Spielberg's film version of The War of the Worlds, which is happening at, I think, 7.20. Uh, I should really know that. Please do follow me at E-D-Y-H-U-R-S-T on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook, um, and and you can see my website, eddiehurst.co.uk. Thanks a lot, guys. I'll see you very soon for Chapter 9. Wrecking!